She has written many poems and books over the past couple of years, but her recent poem, One River, One Boat, made headlines across the country and of course here in the state. And in this special edition of Quentin's Close-Ups, I speak exclusively with poet Marjorie Wimpworth. Marjorie, you know the last time we spoke over the phone, you told me that you were extremely busy with projects yes. here at the Art Institute. Mm -hmm. Tell me as we sit here right now, how are you? I'm good. It's just the first week of classes for spring quarter, so it's kind of hectic. Yeah. Yeah, but thank you for coming over here to do it. It made it easier. <laughs> Anytime. Yeah. And off camera, we actually talked about your new introduction. Oh, the induction. Pardon Induction, me. that's okay. Yeah, the South Carolina Academy of Authors yes. is having the induction yes. ceremonies this weekend in Charleston, and they have three Charleston writers who are being inducted and one dead Charleston writer who was a playwright. So it's me, Dottie Frank, oh, yes. and um, Brett Lott, right. and um, really it's gonna be fun. And then lots of other writers have been inducted and, and it's like, you know, I was always figured, oh, they'll do it 50 years after I die or something, so. So I'm what really, is it like to have it? I'm really happy, right. <laughs> you know. So what is it like to have it now that you are alive? Well, it's a real honor, you know, I'm really excited. It's kind of a, it's like a rite of passage, and a lot of my friends uh, have preceded me. Yes. Like Suma Kid oh, yeah. and um, Terrence Hayes, and Nikki Finney, right. and Kwame Dawes, and John Lane, and Gil Allen, and all, you know, a lot of the, you know, they kind of mix it up by uh, genre. Right. And geography, and, um, but there's a lot of great writers in South Carolina, so it's a real honor, and it's gonna be a lot of fun, and the ceremonies will be at the Citadel. That's gonna be great. Saturday night. I'm and really excited. And you should come. You just got to get a ticket. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of fun, let's talk about the South Carolina Book Festival. Oh, that's always a blast. Yes. Yeah. You yeah. should come. I know, right? Um, it's, well, it used to always be in the winter, and they moved it to May. It's mid-May. Right. And mm -hmm. I'm really excited this year. I don't have a new book out. I had a book out last year, but they've invited me to the opening ceremonies to read the inaugural poem. And since I didn't get to read it at the inauguration, I love reading it in Columbia whenever I have the opportunity. <laughs> so that'll be fun. Okay. And uh, they always have a lot of great writers there, and it's free and open to the public at the uh, convention center in Columbia. Oh, yeah, and um, you know, it's great. If, if you know, it's all kinds of panels going on, and then booksellers are oh, there. Yeah. And yeah. if people are interested in, in writers, they can. They can meet the authors and talk to them and get books, and so I think it's a very it's a very community friendly book festival. And speaking of books, let's talk about the new and selected poems that you just written recently. Well, it came out a, a year ago, right? Recently, right. yeah. So, and the uh, cover is by John Duckworth. Oh yes, local artist. Yes. I like to show that off. I always uh, like to get art from a local artist, so that's that's always a, a fun thing. Why? And why? Yeah. Uh, because I just know so many great artists and it's it's so much fun to work you can actually sit down and and kind of find something i mean i started with my first book i didn't even know jonathan green oh, yeah. and i just thought so many of my poems in my first book noticing eden were very south carolina landscape based right. and i love his work and he was still living in florida and i just called him up wow and I actually had chosen one. He said, oh, no, no, I, I think I have the perfect book cover for you. Mm -hmm. And he emailed me or something and said, just send me some free books. That'll, that's fine, you know. Uh, and it's been like that ever since. Since, yeah. yeah so it's been, and Mary Edna Frazier right. did one. And um, I'm trying to think who else. Anyway, it's, it's always been a good experience. And John Duckworth, um, this was a really interesting. I'd chosen some other images and then went to his studio, and this was just I just oh, I loved it, and I thought yeah. I thought they did a beautiful job with the design. Yes, they did too. So I'm really happy with it. And in between all of these projects, you managed to redesign your website. Well, yes, uh, Marcus Amaker, my dear friend, performance poet, graphic designer, he's just a very talented man. Um, he did it and um, put a lot of heart into it, and I really needed it because my website looked like. Um, you, know, you could tell that oh. I did it. Well, my, my future daughter-in-law was helping me, but she lives in L.A. now, yeah, yeah. and I always felt like I was imposing on her. Okay. And I really, I got a book advance for uh, a children's book that's coming out that I helped write um, with Kwame Alexander, right. who I always love to talk about because he just won the Newbery Medal. Yeah, yeah. Congratulations. Which is so exciting. Yeah, it is. And, um, you know, I just said, you know, I've got to kind of, step up my game here. And and I actually got complaints about my website. Wow. Wow. So, you know, it's kind of like you gotta do your business properly too, you know. Yeah. So 
especially now that you're notable for not being a part of Dominic right. Healy's inauguration. Right. Lots of people noticed that my website was looked like a four-year-old did it. And, okay. uh, told me that. People wow. are very, you know, they'll tell you anything on the internet. Of know? course they do. <laughs> hey, let's recreate the scene because it was January 19th when mm -hmm. you were in Columbia, as you mentioned, and you were on the steps of the South Carolina State House for King Day at the Dome. Oh, that was a great day. Yeah, put on your memory hat. Talk to me more about that experience. Well, I, I don't even remember who contact, uh, somebody contacted me, I think, I don't even remember now. There's so, okay. so much going on. It was because right. the, the inauguration had been that Wednesday. Right. Yeah. And I, somewhere in the, it was crazy. And somebody said, somebody emailed me or called me, I think one of the organizers and said, right. we'd love to have you read this poem at King, King Day, Under the Dome, yeah. and an event that I'd heard about, certainly. And I immediately said yes, without even thinking, oh, I already was going to do something in Charleston at Circular Church. Right. I just said yes, I want to do the idea of, of reading that poem on the State House steps, on the side that faces the flag, right, right, right. just seemed like so perfect. You, you know, it, it sounded like something out of a novel or something. So it was, it was amazing, and I loved the experience. I was cold. It was cold. That's all I have to say about that. Negative part was that it was colder than I thought it would be, but it was a great experience. And the speakers were incredible. I mean, Secretary of Labor was there, right. all kinds of church leaders and folks from the NAACP, right. and uh, I just had a great time. But it really meant a lot to me. I, I you know, it just magical almost the way it all kind of played out and I actually read the poem at three MLK Day events wow. uh, the the back at Circular that afternoon yeah. and then might have been the next morning there's a big MLK breakfast right. um, Keith Waring oh, yes. uh, is a good friend um, his daughter is like our surrogate daughter I guess for lack of a better word we call her Lauren Waring Wentworth but anyway um, he got me he got me invited to the breakfast, and that was fantastic. So it was just the perfect poem. It was almost meant to be. Yes, and something else you experienced was Congressman Jim Clyburn. Oh, well, that was just like one of the most amazing yeah. things. And that that was such a surprise when he read the poem into the congressional record, you know. And um, he did that the night, uh, the actual evening uh, or the day right. of the, the inauguration right. for Nikki Haley and what is amazing is what he said before he read the poem you know what he said about me what he said about the First Amendment what he said about um, the fact that I wasn't allowed to read the poem and, he, and it was also the same week that the horrible um, murders happened at the Charlie Hebdo offices yeah. in Paris, so right. free speech was in the air. So he was able in just sort of like four or five paragraphs to sort of plop the poem into the middle of all of that. And uh, it was just, I mean, when I, I was actually here, I was on the elevator right. leaving class and my friend Dean Stevens right. texted me yes. and I was watching it on C-SPAN on my phone right. and I just burst out crying wow. because it, it just was such a surprise. and. Then I got an email or a text or something from Amanda Lovejoy, who's his assistant, I guess, right, and right. she said he wanted to speak to me, what I call this number. Right. And I called him that night, and my instinct was, you know, who put him up to this? Like, I don't know. I just couldn't believe it. It happened. And he told me that, that the poem, oh, let me see if I can remember exactly what he said. He said, and he has this beautiful, deep, resonant oh, yeah. voice, yeah. Right? yeah, I interviewed him last year for oh, Quintus Close. Right. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. He said, um, that poem said everything I want to say about my 76 years on earth, right. and I want everyone to know that, and I want everyone to hear it. So it meant the world to me, you know. And then he sent me a, um, the actual proclamation. Right, or, yeah. Yeah, and it's in, uh, it's hard to explain it, but it looks like Kind of like a graduation oh, yeah. diploma in a beautiful... Yeah, like a resolution. Right, yeah, but yeah, it's yeah, beautifully... Yeah. And I, I don't know what to... Put it up on the mantle, oh, you know. and, and uh, But it really... Uh, I can't tell you how much it, it means to me. And, and he's just... To, he's such a hero of mine okay. and, and a rock star. And I actually met him here because he's very good friends with the former president of the Art Institute, Rick Giroux, oh, yes. um, who worked for Congress, and they had offices next to each other. Um, and so I'd met him briefly, but that was just the great. And then, of course, it, lots of people. Oh, wow! Who's this poet? We better read. You know. <laughs> yeah. But it was a great honor. And was that? Let me ask you this: 
Did you have, what, what part of you said, hey, I'm finally at peace knowing that, hey, I didn't get to address my poem at the inauguration, but it was addressed on the House of Representatives floor? Well, and also in South Carolina. Right, yeah. Um, you know, it, it, it really, what, what meant, well, at it, it, it a personal level, the fact that this man who I worship and revere, um, that it meant that much to him. I mean, when you write, especially poetry, people don't read poetry generally. So the idea that it got that recognition and that, that it meant so much to him and so many other people uh, was really uh, such a, um, you know, was such a fulfilling uh, experience because, you know, you, no matter who you are, you, when you publish your work and whatever, you write to be read and you want people to feel something. And the fact that it meant so much to him and others, it wasn't really a moment of vindication in any way. It was more a feeling of, wow, all these people think like I think. Oh, and that's the feeling of, of uh, joy that you get as a writer, which uh, was completely unexpected. You know, I mean, you know, you don't know how your work's going to be received. Exactly. So it was a huge surprise that there was such a response and I, I heard from people all over the country. Oh. So it clearly meant, I mean, there's a lot of people who felt strongly about it and um, that's always a good feeling when you're a writer. You know? Let's rewind to January 19th. As it was the actual inauguration day in Columbia and as you mentioned, it was cold that week, you know, and the week afterwards. Um, unfortunately, you weren't able to attend that particular inauguration. Tell me, where were your heart and mind? The day of the inauguration? Right. I was here working all day, yeah. you know, and I I was surprised that I they didn't want me to read the poem. I was surprised that I wasn't even invited to the inauguration. But as I said to the media at the time, I didn't take it personally. I really, you know, I didn't take it personally. And by then, I think the weekend before that Saturday, well, Charleston Currents published an article and published the poem on Friday, right. Andy Brack, and then Saturday was the front page of the Post and Courier, right. and by then, you know, I was doing, there was so much media attention that, that came out of nowhere that I was so overwhelmed with these, I mean, like, I was doing interviews in closed classrooms, right. you know, trying, yeah. NPR and right, stuff right, like that. Right. I was like, what's, I didn't really have time to stop and think about it, and um, was I wasn't really, I wasn't really even thinking about the inauguration. Yeah. I was so caught up with trying to answer these questions and trying to absorb this response that just shocked me beyond belief. And, and what was your secret to dealing with that publicity? Well, fortunately, um, you know, I used to, <laughs> it's ironic that for many years I worked as a book and television right. publicist. So media doesn't throw me, and I know you gotta be very careful about what right. you say, and right. there were certain things I did not tell the media. Uh, and I was very, it did, didn't really throw me. I was surprised at, at, at the, the amount of it and, and the response. And people really um, wanted me to say certain things that I wouldn't say, like bad things about the governor and whatnot. And, and you know, I just kept coming, there, there were the, I just kept coming back to the facts, yeah. you know. And the facts were that, yes, the poem was formally rejected, but there was no, I can't, Second guess. Yeah. Uh, who knows? Right. It could have been something. Could have been um, any number of things. Right. Uh, so. And something you told the uh, State House report art, uh, report that is in an article. You basically said about your poem being excluded from inauguration. You said, "quote It certainly is a statement about their ideology. The arts are of no value." So tell me, was no? I feel I still feel very strongly about that. Well, I'm not. I wouldn't say that the arts are of no value, but they, the 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 sort of Tea Party. Okay. stance is that there's no government funding for the arts. Now, um, I do know that the State Arts Commission budget is actually up this year, right. but pretty consistently that's the ideology. And the idea that the private sector is going to suddenly start funding the arts, what, what are you talking about? Show me the corporate infrastructure in South Carolina that's funding the arts. Everybody knows that Boeing and Amazon, everybody goes after them. But we don't have, we're not, this isn't like Connecticut, you know, we don't have that kind of economic base here. And um, it's, it's, you know, I think that a culture in the end, you know, that's what's going to endure. 
it are the stories and the art and the music. I mean, you, you even think about across the country. That's, that sh that's the shining star of South Carolina is our arts. Yes, think yes. about it. All the people that we're so proud. We have who lives here and the, 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 the books and art and music and everything that's produced from South Carolina. That's really, you'd think that that would be what we'd want to invest in, whether it's arts education or just the arts in general. Yeah. But I think it's a general attitude. You know, just not, you know. And I'm sure they had songs and stuff at the inauguration. That's the arts. They didn't. You know. And you told the Post and Courier, quote, it's not personal. So what part of you being excluded from the inauguration was personal, and which part of it was political to you? Um, personal meaning, if I saw Nikki Haley, I, I think she's very charming. She and, is. And, when I, and she's also beautiful in person, I think she's, and I, I really liked her when I have met her, I've only met her once or twice, no problem with her. Um, you know, I think they have committees and who knows who makes these decisions. So I also think she's being pretty seriously looked at as a vice presidential candidate. I think you'd have to be, I mean, I think that's pretty obvious. And I, I think that... And how do you correlate that to... Well, I think operation? that, you know, who knows, but I, I think that... Certainly, the poem, I don't know if it was decided before they even read the poem. Okay. You know? I understand they didn't read your poem at all. Before no, it was, sent, it was sent to them. Okay. But the decision, I heard through a reliable source, let's leave it at that, that they had made the decision before they saw the poem. Then I called the Arts Commission and said, whoa, what do I do? I've been working my butt off on this poem, and you know, I'm certainly willing to have a conversation. I assumed they were going to vet it, you know. And they said, oh, no, 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 you send it in. You send it in, they have to formally reject the poem. But that's why it was complicated to explain it, because they did, I did hear through a third party, I guess we'll put it that way, um, a trusted source who just called the inaugural committee and said, how come you guys haven't, what's going on with Marjorie Wentworth? And they said, um, we, you know, we, uh, we're not going to have a poem this time. And then the Arts Commission said, you send it in anyway. Now, some people think it's because of the Facebook page that I posted on December 3rd, which said, you know, I'm going to do an inaugural poem again, and I'm really excited. It's a chance for me to, um, you know, speak for other people. If, what's your dream for South Carolina? Yeah. And nobody said anything about slavery, by the way. People, but people talked a lot about, um, you know, education and, uh, you know, the violence against women equal rights, um, gay rights, you know, just all of the issues that we know are sort of hot topic issues and the, the things that we know are social justice issues in our state. Right, right, right. But nobody, I don't think, I mean, I have to look at it again, I don't think anyone said anything directly about Nikki Haley. There was nothing offensive in there. But who knows? Yeah. So I, I really don't know. They've never told me. And would they have wanted me saying the, the talk? talking about the flag, I don't think so, but I never heard it and never got anything in writing. Wow. So why would, I'm, I'm just, I only know what I know. Yeah. So I meant, I think that I'd always played it safe before that and sort of, you know, I also recognize the fact that inauguration is about, you're celebrating, it's their day, it's the governor elect's yeah. day. And when you become a poet laureate, you know that you shouldn't take it on if you can't do that. You know, be respectful. You, I mean, you don't know who's going to be governor, right? So that's part of the deal. You yeah. shouldn't do it. So, and I also felt like I was very careful with this poem that I didn't talk about policy. I just decided very early on I wanted it to be about people and I wanted to certainly make us stop and think about you know, almost like hold a mirror up to the past, yeah. you know, and because there's no question that a lot of the issues that we face are tied to that. And, but I never really, it's, it's done in a poetic way. I don't, I don't, it, it, it's just like, let's stop and let's think about where we are before we move forward. That's, and, and that's what the poem does. And I, I thought about how am I going to be true to myself and, and be respectful. Right. Um, and I felt it, obviously I did it, but I, I was teaching, I was actually in this classroom yeah. teaching Langston Hughes, of who's course. my favorite poet, and I always start with Langston Hughes by telling my students, even though he's dead and he was gay, I still have a crush on him. 
But I love like they don't they look at me like she's crazy. But I love like he's I love his work and he was able to be very respectful and say exactly what he wanted to yeah. say without being polemic and you know and I kind of was reading him and thinking and that was once I kind of got that tone I was able to do it. And when did you know you wanted your poem to be nonpartisan? I didn't want to be, uh, I, I knew to do, I really thought that I was going to be doing this poem. Right, right, right. So I wrote it to be, you know, I, I wrote it in such a way that it would be thought provoking, yeah. but not disrespectful. Of course. Does that make sense? Yeah, perfect. And you also write it to just be heard. It's yeah. a very, lots of imagery. It's nothing complicated in that poem. And the only thing I have to explain when I read it, especially when I'm not in South Carolina, people might not know who George Steen was. Right? So I have to explain that reference. Sure. Uh, yeah. But otherwise, it's pretty clear. He doesn't need any explanation. So I really wrote it to, to be heard at the inauguration. So. Well, listen, I remember seeing a New York Times article that basically asked, is poetry really dead? Let me ask you bluntly, is poetry really dead or is it second coming on the rise? I don't think either. Okay. It has no market value. Okay. And it's very strange to have the, the, the work that is really the most important thing to you. It's no monetary value right. in a capitalist culture. Right. You know, if I was a painter, I'd sell my painting. I mean, I just published a poem in... Um, uh, five Points, a great magazine out of Georgia, and they sent me a $50 check. Now, I love Five Points, and all kinds of amazing poets are there. It was a great, great honor, and I just wrote a blog entry for them. But that's, and that's one of the great literary magazines in America. I got paid $50. So that's an interesting thing to have the art form that your, the, 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 your art form or your, you know, right. uh, your work have no monetary value. Uh, that's a problem. Yes. And, um, you know, poetry books, you don't get advances for poetry books right. generally. And, you know, I, I'm teaching five classes right now. I gotta, uh, I, I gotta make a living. Yeah. So, you know, we're taking care of my mom now. now. You know, it's. And how is she doing? You know, two steps forward, one step back. <laughs> She's okay. She's looking forward to this weekend. But it's tough. And, you know, I. It's, it is what it is. I mean, most poets have to teach. I think that um, I was surprised at the response to the inaugural poem because so many people who read that inaugural poem, I think they were surprised, like that little skinny white girl. You know, I mean, I had people say that to me. Okay. Well, they've never read anything I've written. So, you know, I wrote a book on human rights with the UN Special Rapporteur on the Prevention of Torture. I mean, anybody who knows me would not be surprised by this poem. But if you don't know me and you've never read my work, like where did that come from? So uh, it's tough to be a poet because it's it's not you know it, my feeling is generally it's not something that people generally read, right. but then at the most extreme moments in your life, like at your wedding, at a funeral, after nine eleven, everybody wants poetry. So that's interesting. Um, you know. As we talk about Governor Nikki Haley's inauguration, I want to go back to the inauguration poem because um, initially you were chosen to recite your poem at the inauguration before that you know, controversial decision. Tell me when you spoke with the inauguration team, what was that like? It was just a quick email. Yeah. You know, okay. I, uh, I knew the person, I worked with her for Mark Sanford's inaugurations, oh, yeah. and I I don't know why I wasn't offended. I was so surprised that I wasn't offended. Does, does that make sense? I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Uh, it was very like all business. Oh. So just like we have too much going on, we oh. have all this. I'm like, okay, whatever. Uh, enough people that mean a lot to me certainly voice, you know, I mean, it certainly offended a lot of other people. Okay. Um, it, I, 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 I would say that it, certainly could have been handled better, and I think they'd say the same thing. How so? Well, if they had made a decision to not have a poem, for whatever reason, I do wish that they had let me know ahead of time and explained it to me. I mean, that is the one thing that a poet laureate does. It's the one thing you have to do. You, 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 you 
do the governor's inauguration. Of course. And it's it's always a challenge, and you know you figure it out. And I just wish. Well, now in retrospect, I suppose I wouldn't change a thing. You really? know, but I wish they. Why well, do you say that? Well, because I'm glad I wrote the poem, and it. I'm really glad I wrote the poem, and and you know it. I write a lot of poems that. Um, have this a lot of the ideas that are in this poem. I mean, I wrote a children's book you did. about when you know that has to do with the history of slavery, and uh, but a lot of people haven't read it. So, what's nice about this poem is that a, it meant a lot to a lot of people. And if it hadn't been banned, they wouldn't have heard it, so or read it. So it ended up being a good thing in the end. Yeah. You know, you can't go. You know, bad. but I, I, I just, I don't know. Maybe someday they'll tell me. What do you want them to tell you right now? I because you seem like you're still Well, no, no I, I mean I guess I I I mean I, I'm just beginning. I'm being to honest with you. I mean no no no, just beginning to kind of absorb all of this. Because it was just so fast and furious and surprising. And, and what was it like to be Marjorie Wentworth over it, those past couple of days doing that whole entire I did, controversy? I just it was the first week of the semester. Yeah. And I just, it was, it was a whirlwind, wow. you know? I just was, you know, I don't even remember Maybe it, really. Wow. It was a blur. Maybe. And I, well, I was teaching. I mean, my favorite moment was when I did my NPR interview. They said, well, we've been trying to reach you. What were you doing? And I said, I was teaching my band books class yeah. at the College of Charleston. Right. And now I'm a band author. And of course, I had no time to prepare. Right, right, right. So I showed them. I said, well, here, I'm a band author now. Watch this. And I showed them the video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the, my favorite moment was I did an Al Jazeera interview. And the woman said, uh, I said, you know, I have between 4.15 and 4.30. You know, I'm literally like between classes. Right, yeah, I yeah. couldn't like cancel classes. Sure. And she says to me, um, can I ask you a question before we begin? And I thought she was going to ask me, you know, are you married? Or, yeah, I don't know what she was going to ask me. Something, you know, do you have children? Something like that. Usually they ask you something like that. She said, are you related to Rebecca Wentworth? And I said, Rebecca Marshies Wentworth? She said, yes. I, I said, why? She said, well, that was my college roommate. I said, that's my niece. Wow. Who, who lives and works in Tanzania. So right. it's so funny. funny. Like a small world. world. Like Al Jazeera, is. you know. So, uh, you know, I don't know. It, it, it's... I think it, in the end, it worked in my favor, and I think a lot of people, you know, it's like I wrote something that really mattered to people, and that, that, it was worth it. I mean, it was such a, it's such a, um, you know, the life of a poem is interesting, and the life of this poem is not over yet. Yes. You know? And, you know, you just told me that you're just now absorbing that huge cloud of controversy over the poem being not addressed at the inauguration. Tell me, what do you want to take away from all of this experience? Well, I think one, well, it, it gave me a sort of, it boosted my confidence yeah. that it's okay. I mean, you got to remember, too, it, it's tricky territory when you're not African American oh. and you're writing about these issues, and I'm very fortunate to be friends with Suma Kit, who wrote Secret Life of Bees, right. and then just more recently, a year ago, her book came out, well, a year and a half now, The Invention of Wings, which, you know, is about the Grimke sisters and who were abolitionists from Charleston. And it's been great to talk to her because you're in a weird situation. Um, and one of the things that she always says is that when you think about slavery, it's this sort of unhealed wound, but it isn't going to heal unless we all participate in it, in the healing process. And if you think about what's happened in this country, what's still happening, um, and what happened, you know, if you think about this poem was January, and right. sort of, you know. And we had everything, all the protests in Ferguson and all these deaths of unarmed black men coming up to that, right? And, and this poem sort of dropped into the void because really, what are we going to do with all that? What's going on? I mean, different organizations and different people are writing things. But, you know, collectively, 
uh, as, a, as a nation, we're in the middle of a, of a crisis. And I think that was part of the, the wind behind that poem. And, and, and it, I didn't write the poem in a vacuum. Obviously, I was reading about these right. things and thinking about them. And uh, so it, it's, it made me feel like, you know, I'm not the only one who feels this way. I'm not the only one who's upset about these things. I'm not the only one who looks at the effects of, of government policy on everybody. And you know, I was a human rights activist, and I look at everything through that, through that, that window. And not everybody does. You are a mother, you are a wife, and a teacher, and of course a Fort Laureate. Which one describes you the best and why? I don't really Categorize. separate it okay. out. I mean, my kids are all in their 20s now, and now I'm busy. And they're moving to LA. Now I'm busy taking care of my mother. Right, you right. know, but that's the word, the sandwich generation. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think when you're a mom, that's always the, the when you, your kids are growing up, that's always the, the, you know, the thing that is your focus. Right. And certainly, um, I, I don't think that, I doubt that ever changes, so. I don't know. I mean, I, I, um, I, I don't. I don't. I think it, it all. I don't. I don't think of it that way. I kind of, you know, blend it all together. Speaking of focus, what do you focus on next? Well, I actually. Uh, well, I'm always working on a new book of, of poems, course. and yeah. my next book of poems will be called "The News from Poems." Yeah. And my inaugural, the inaugural poem, "One River, One Boat," will yes. be there. Be in that book. Um, because a lot of the pieces of that poem came from things I read in the news. And I write a lot of those poems. Some of them are very uh, kind of dark poems about horrific things. And some of them are hysterically funny about like a kangaroo that gets into a drugstore <laughs> in an airport in Australia. I don't know. You know, I mean, they're really funny, but they're news articles. So, yeah. so I, I've really uh, kind of got a lot of poems like that, and it's kind of interesting. And the idea is that the news is often just these little clips and very two minutes of this or that, and you know, the whole story isn't there. Like, what, what else? What's going on behind it? Um, what does that really mean for that these people? I'm really interested in that. Um, what are the repercussions? What's the human story behind it? Yeah. So I really have fun with that. And um, so then I'm working on that. And then I'm working on a nonfiction book oh. that I've been kind of working on off and on for years. I, I taught poetry at uh, Roper Hospital for like 15 years to cancer patients oh. and their families. And I've written a lot about that. And I have um, in the kind of working with a new agent to, to try to kind of shape that into. Yeah. He wants me to put more of myself into this book. But um, it's, it's a, it was a really extraordinary experience. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to sinking my teeth into that. And then teaching. I'm teaching a lot of classes right, right now. Yeah, yeah. The artist, dude. <laughs> so, and, and the college. So I'm busy. And I forgot to ask you this, but what has one river, one boat teach, taught you about? Taught me? Yes. Oh, wow. Um, it taught me that, again, the things that I really care passionately about, the things that really matter deeply to me, yeah. matter to a lot of people. And I, that's a really good feeling, you know, yeah. to feel that, that lots of people really care about the same things. That's awesome. So that's a good feeling. Yeah. A great feeling. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Well, Marjorie Wentworth, this was very interesting. <laughs> Lord, well, this Lord, was Lord. fun. Easy. <laughs> Thank you. All right. I appreciate that. No, thanks for coming over.